how would you feel if you went out to the mailbox today and you, among all the bills and the junk mail, there was a special envelope with special ink and you eagerly open it up and it's an invitation. It says you were invited to a banquet feast. Signed, Jesus the Christ, Son of God. You don't have to guess how you would feel because you see, Jesus has made that invitation to you and to me. Mm, quite a while back, my son and I were having a conversation and David said, Dad, you know, it's really interesting to me, for however long they've done this, evangelists have encouraged people to invite Jesus into their hearts, invite him into their lives. When it's really the other way around, Jesus has invited us into his heart. He's invited us into his life. I mean, he's made the invitation. We either respond yes or no, but he's the one that does the inviting, not us. We're the ones that does the accepting, not him. He invites us to himself. I think, you know, that's pretty insightful. God has given that boy an interesting insight. and He planted a seed that day that I began a journey searching, doing research, thinking, praying, studying, and I'm still not finished on some of the conclusions that I'm tentatively drawing, but I want to share with you a few of the things that I've learned along this journey. God has started writing an invitation way back at the beginning when he created the heavens and the earth, and he created a man, created a garden, he brought the man into the garden. He created some animals. He brought the animals to the man. He named the animals. He was nervous. He was lonely. He said, why don't I have a helper? I don't have a helper. I'm alone. God said, it's not good that you're alone. So he put him into a deep sleep. He took a bone from his side. He fashioned a woman. He brought the woman to the man. And Adam said, whoa, man, a woman came from man. And don't, don't get hung up on that. God had to start somewhere. He started with the man. He created the woman from his side where she would walk through the rest of her life at his side. A covenant relationship between the man and the woman that God started in Genesis chapter 1 when he said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. And so God created man in his image after his likeness male and female, created he them. And he gave them dominion over all of the earth. And he told them, be fruitful and multiply and fill up the earth. He gave them a garden. Now, if I read this correctly, it was on the sixth day that God created the man. Whether you think it's a 24 hour period or a million years, out, that's not the purpose of this lesson. The purpose of this lesson is that the sixth time period, the sixth day, God created the man, made a garden, created animals, brought them to the man, and then he created the woman close to the end of the sixth day. What was their first full day experience together? That's right, the seventh day, the Sabbath day. And on that day, God rested. He ceased from his labor. Now the verb that's used there, rested, stopped working, ceased from his labor, is the same word that's used in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. We'll come back to that in just a moment. It was then about 1500 years before Christ when God used Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea to the mountainside where God then gave Moses the law. He came back down the mountainside with two tablets of stone with 10 words, 10 commandments on them. And one of them was, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Set it apart, remember this day special. Why? On that day, God rested. On that day, you rest. 
on the seventh day, the Sabbath day. But realize the Sabbath doesn't mean seven. It just happened to be on the seventh day that God designated this would be the day of rest. Sabbath, rest. Now, Sabbath means rest, but also there's a verb that goes with Sabbath or a noun that's called the Sabbath rest. That word is the word in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, that's used in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, which is almost identical to the word that was used in Genesis chapter 2. On that day, God rested. And God designed people with the need to rest. I mean, you have a need for about six to eight hours of rest. And in that rest, you're creative. Your creative juices are flowing. Your mind is free. But more importantly, perhaps, your body is being rejuvenated. It is recreated. It's a recreation time for your body, not just your mind. And your body not only is rejuvenating, in many respects, it's like a kickstart when you rest. When you have decent amount of rest, your mind is clearer, you have more energy, and you're able to accomplish far more. It used to be thought that if you stayed up late at night, you burn more calories, you burn fat, and so it's actually a sort of a dietary aid to stay up through the night. Now they know differently. Nutritionists have determined that if you, are able, if you go for a period of time and allow your body to rest from food and rest when you sleep, that that has a healing effect on the body. What do I mean? Well, fasting and sleeping are two of the best things you can do for your body to rejuvenate and even heal, listen to me, heal some diseases. Apparently, and I'm quoting now Dr. Berg, I'm referring to Dr. Berg, nutritionist, chiropractor. You'll find him on the internet, B-E-R-G. I highly recommend going to his videos, he's got thousands of them, three to five minutes long, talking about nutritional, um, not supplements, but nutritional uh, issues and the body and intermittent fasting. And he says that it's been shown by research that three to seven days of fast can actually shrink and destroy a cancerous tumor. That's right, you heard me right. It can kill a cancer tumor. That long periods of fasting allow your body to focus on fighting a disease. It's like a, a kickstart. It's like a pushing a reset button for your body. But not only that, you're starving that particular cancerous tumor of the sugars that it needs in order to survive. And so it dies and shrivels up and it's gone. The body then dissolves it and eliminates it from the system. What I'm saying is your body needs some rest. It needs rest from food. That's what fasting is about, intermittent fasting, whether it's a day or three days or seven days, or as some I know have been fasting apparently occasionally for 40 days. 40 days without food? Hey, don't be too surprised. Moses did that 40 days, receiving the law from God. And then he went back up on the mountainside for another 40 days and fasted. And then Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And Jesus fasted 40 days and 40. There's something to this 40-day fast. I haven't done it. I don't see myself doing it. But I have done several days of a fast, and I have found it to be beneficial for me because, you see, you're allowing your body to rest from having constantly to digest food. And when it doesn't have the carbohydrate and the food to digest, it then turns to the fat and burns fat in your body as well for that short period of time in those intervals. Okay, so rest. Rest your body. Rest it from food. Rest it at night to sleep. God designed you with the need to rest. But we don't get enough rest. He even said, I want there to be a special day of rest for his people. And it was a symbolic gesture that God was creating a day for his people to rest so that they would learn something. See, the Sabbath, people weren't made in order to observe the Sabbath. The Sabbath was designed 
to make the people, to design, or it was designed to help grow certain things within his people. Let me show you what I mean. This first one day a week, seventh day, they were to rest and make it holy unto the Lord. Every festival that God inaugurated, he said that is a Sabbath day or days, this festival. There was a seventh month that was a month that was a Sabbath month. Then there was a seventh year. And on the seventh year, debts were to be forgiven. And on the 49th year, which is the seven times seven, the 49th year was a great Sabbath year that the people were forbidden to work the grounds and work their animals. They were to, they were to make sure that the ground rested and the animals rested and they themselves rested. Now watch what happens. Also, by the way, the next year, 50th year, was called what? You got it, Jubilee. And on the Jubilee was a great year of celebration, but it is also a Sabbath year, a year of rest. So on the 51st year, they would actually till the fields and plant their, their seeds. And then later on in the harvest, they would have food from the 51st year. How do you survive on the 49th year and the 50th year? Two entire years. God is teaching his people that on the 48th year, they were to work and God gave them an abundance of crops. And then on the 49th year, they were to do no work and they would live off of the 48th year. But on the 50th year, they were to do no work and so they were going to live off the 48th year. And on the 51st year, at least half of that year, if not more, they were going to live on the 48th year. Do you see what God is teaching his people? Depend on me. I'll take care of you. Put me first. Now, I want you to hear the, the, uh, the invitation that Jesus gave. It was right after he had condemned the cities that the apostles had gone to and performed miracles and, and they had rejected the message from the apostles. And he says, you know, it would have been better uh, for Sodom, Gomorrah, it would be better for Tyre and Sidon, and Chorazin. I, if, if they would have seen the miracles that you guys experienced, they would have repented. It's going to be easier on judgment day for Sodom than it is for you because you had the miracles and you rejected. So they have the capacity to respond. It's not that God is going to dictate who is saved and who's not saved. No, that's not it. But rather, they refused and God was going to condemn them because of their refusing the evidence that was in front of their very eyes. And then Jesus said, Father, I am so glad, thank you, that you have revealed yourself, the knowledge of who you are and the wisdom to these little children, referring to his disciples, these children and not the wealthy and the wise. People are beginning to scratch their heads now. Who is it that are among the educated? Who is it among the wise? Isn't it the wealthy? Aren't the ones who have lived longer and or maybe have a religious degree? No, 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 no. They're not necessarily the wisest. But Jesus is saying to these children, you have revealed yourself. And I have revealed, in fact, I'm the only one who can reveal you, and you're the one who gives me these people. And then he turns to the people, and he says to them, here's where we read Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, 29, and 30. Hear it again. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Right after that, Matthew records two events concerning the Sabbath and disagreements that the religious leaders had with Jesus concerning the Sabbath. The first one was the disciples were walking through the fields, they were getting some grain, rubbing it, and they were eating the grain that they had just 
harvested according to the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. They were working on the Sabbath. And now why do you let your disciples do that? And Jesus answers them by saying, what about David? I mean, David, your man, David, actually went into the temple of God and ate the showbread that was there. The priest gave it to him and he broke the law. Why would Jesus use that argument? Real, real quickly, as a side point. Who are they expecting to come to rescue them from Roman dominion? That's right, the son of David. A descendant of David who would be a bloody revolutionary, an insurrectionist, one who would lead the people to a bloody revolution, overthrowing the Roman government and establishing the kingdom of God on earth where all the nations of the earth would come to Israel to have relationship with God and to receive blessings from God. And by the way, probably pay homage to God by giving those blessings to the people. They were expecting that. They were expecting a king-like figure, son of David. So Jesus refers to their man, and he says, what about David? He actually broke the law. See, they didn't break the, Jesus didn't break the law. His disciples didn't break the law. It was one of their traditional commandments that they had laid on top of the law. See, the Pharisees were really good at creating a lot of commandments to make sure that the people did not break the laws of God. The Old Testament has about 635 laws, 637, give or take. And then on top of that, the Pharisees had added thousands and thousands of other commandments that if you kept those commandments, you would automatically keep these other commandments. They were obligatory, mandatory for all the people, especially the Sabbath day. They really believed that if they, as a nation, could keep the Sabbath holy, one day perfectly holy, and no one violated any of their commandments on the Sabbath, Messiah would come. The revolution would begin. They would overthrow the shackles. They would throw off the shackles of Rome and they would establish the kingdom of God if they could only keep one pure Sabbath. Now here comes Jesus. Jesus obviously is a candidate to be the Messiah until they see him breaking their traditions, their laws. Now they have trouble with the man and they set out to destroy him. And then the second argument he makes is, you know, in the law itself, God tells the priests to break the law. Because on the Sabbath, when it comes time to circumcise the baby, if it falls on the eighth day and it's a Sabbath day, the priest is to obey the law and circumcise the child and disobey the law by doing work on the Sabbath. So God told them, you will obey the law by disobeying the law. <laughs> now that really threw them into a tizzy. They thought, what, how are we going to handle that argument, right? I mean, it's kind of like the police officer has to go 80 miles an hour to catch you going 75 miles an hour because you're in the speed zone of 50 miles an hour. He broke the law to catch you breaking the law, but you can't turn to the judge and say, well, he broke the law too because he broke the law in order to keep the law to give you a ticket for breaking the law. That's what Jesus is saying. The priest, in order to keep the law, they had to break the law. And so even if they are breaking the law, it's permissible. Because you see, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I'm over this rest thing that I'm teaching them how to depend on me. Is there, and then there were, the other example that Matthew gives is a man with a withered hand in the synagogue. And they say, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And Jesus responds, is it right to do good or to do evil on the Sabbath? And they refuse to answer. And Mark says Jesus became very angry at them because they refused to answer the question. And so he didn't touch the man. He didn't do anything special. He just simply told the man. He, in fact, I guess in a way, invited the man to do something. He said, stretch your hand out. And as he did, his hand, his withered, shriveled hand became whole. He was healed. Instead of celebrating this and thanking God for expressing his power and healing this man, even on the Sabbath day, they, the Jewish leaders, set out to kill Jesus, to design ways to entrap him and ultimately kill him. Why? Because he broke the Sabbath. He obviously could not be the Messiah. 
Messiah would never do that. In fact, he would lead us to keep the Sabbath holy and never work. But what Jesus says, introducing these two issues with the Jewish leaders in Matthew chapter 12, Matthew tells, tells us on page 11 of his book that Jesus makes this special invitation to them and through the 2,000 years of time, it still rings to us. Come to me, all you, all you who are weary. I mean, you're frazzled. You're razzled. You are bedazzled. You are stressed. You're hurting. You're grieving. You're mourning. You are so torn up. People close to you are getting sick. They're dying. You've, you're being rejected. You maybe lost your job. You're, you're wondering how I'm going to pay the bills. How are we going to pay for our house? Are we going to live homeless? What's going to happen? Can we depend on the government? No. Can we depend on Trump? No. Can we depend on any president? No. Who can we depend on? Where can we turn? And Jesus says, come to me, you weary people. Are you weary? Do you feel stressed out? Do you feel like you're losing hope? Jesus said, come to me. Are you heavy laden? The religion that you thought was going to give you life has actually weighed you down. And you're finding that the church maybe even has added a lot of commandments that Jesus never added. And that in order for you to feel like you're accepted, you're going to have to keep these things. You're obligated to do these things. And even the things that Jesus has commanded, you're saying, all right, I guess I'm going to have to do this because I don't want to go to hell. I want to be able to go to heaven, so I better keep the commandments because I don't want to be punished. And you're obligated to do that. See, it's burdensome. But Jesus says this, come to me, you are, you're weary, you're heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Huh, what's he talking about? Well, remember, the Sabbath day, the Sabbath feast, the Sabbath years, all of the Sabbath experience that God gave his people were designed, primarily, I believe, were designed to create a greater, deeper faith in the people to depend on God and not on themselves, not on their land, not on their wealth, not on their neighbors, but depend on God who would provide for them specially, as he did to the wilderness the manna, as he did to the wilderness the raven, as he did to the wilderness when Christ the rock followed them through the wilderness and he hit the rock and water came out. Listen, God provided for the people 40 years and he told them when you go into the land and you're in houses you did not build and you're eating from crops you did not, you did not plant, you didn't harvest, all you did was go out and collect and you're experiencing a wealth that you did not earn. Remember, it is the Lord who has given you these things. I don't care what you've built. I don't care what you've inherited. Whatever you have that's good in your life is from the Lord. And whatever you have that is negative in your life, that's harmful and hurtful and stressful and weary producing, God is there to work through those circumstances to train you. Trust me. Give me. Give me those issues. I'll give you rest. See, in the midst of all of that, you can go through any circumstance with hope in your heart, a dependence on God, because you know that the God of heaven loves you deeply and he'll take care of you. He promised it. He said, look at the, the birds of the air. Look at the flowers of the field. God feeds them. God clothes them. God takes care of their needs. And if God will do that for them, won't he do that for you? Aren't you more, aren't you more valuable than the grass of the field? Aren't you more valuable than the birds of the air? Come on, people. Where's your faith? Oh, you, he says, of little faith. So don't seek after what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. The Gentiles, the non-believers, the heathens of the world, they eagerly seek after those things. But you're different. You've chosen a different lifestyle because God has chosen you. You've chosen a different lifestyle. Seek first the kingdom of God, all of these things. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, 
all of these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He will provide all of these things. Whether it's healing in your life, calm in your mind, a sincere steadiness of your heart, even though the world around you is crumbling and shaking and you are under stress and burden-filled, burden-laden, even from religion, even from, listen, even from your own sin. My Jesus takes care of every burden, especially the sin, from which a lot of our anxiety is derived. Consider this. You feel ashamed. You feel guilty. It's hard to sleep at night. You're fearful that you might be found out. You're wondering, does anybody really know the real me? Do they see how weak I am, how much I've fallen? Can God use me? Can he even use me anymore? I have failed him so much. And it just seems like the same thing over and over. And I promise God, I swear to him, I'll never do it again. And yet here I am begging again for forgiveness. And Jesus says, it is on my cross that I allow them to nail my hands and my feet. I let my blood flow. I paid the full penalty for you. Listen to the words of Jesus when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He took your sins into his body. He knew no sin, but he became sin so that he could give us his righteousness so that we could grow and become more and more righteous in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our attitudes, in our values, in our behaviors. And Jesus said, I will pay the full penalty. It is done. He has paid for every sin you have committed, are committing, or ever will commit. He's paid in advance. When did Jesus die for your sins? Was it after you sinned or before you sinned? Yeah, a couple thousand years before. So that's my point. His death on the cross covers all sin. That covers all sin. All sin. You just need to receive the invitation. I would like to give you forgiveness. I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. Jesus is making the invitation to you. I don't care, maybe you've been a Christian for years and you're hearing this for the first time, really breaking through. Jesus Christ is inviting you into his heart, into his life. And as you do, follow him. You learn from him. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. See, we're discipling from Jesus. We're helping other people become disciples of Jesus. Become disciples of Jesus, not our disciples, not the disciples of our church, not the disciples of what we do. It's not like we're helping them to come to us as we get closer to God. No, 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 we're bringing them to have a direct relationship with God through Jesus and learning how to live all over again, gain a new perspective, a new way of thinking, a new set of attitudes, a great new set of values. You've got to throw off the world values and take on a new set of values and see life from a new perspective, from his eyes, from his perspective, to live life the right way, the way that he designed you to live. That's right. You were designed to live in a way that is comfortable. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He says, I'm gentle. I'm humble. I'm not arbitrary. I'm not an ogre. I'm not demanding from you. I'm inviting you. Will you come to me? Would you come to me, please? I am gentle. I'm humble of heart. And he says, and you will find rest to your souls. Where was that? When Jesus said that, where did he, where, where did he say that before? Well, I, I, I don't know. When you look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you're not going to find it there. You're going to find Jesus saying that before to the people of Israel through the prophet Jeremiah. It is through the Spirit of Christ that Jeremiah prophesied. And Jeremiah says, Stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But they said, 
We're not going to walk in it. And I set watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. What did the watchmen, what were they for? The enemy's coming. Wake up. They blow the trumpet to wake up the people. And here's what the people said. We will not listen. Therefore, hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster on this people and the fruit of their plans because they have not listened to my words. And as for my law, they've rejected it too. You'll find rest for your souls. God promised that to Jerusalem. God promised that to the nation of Judah. And they refused. Jesus promises that to us. He has revealed himself to us as the Son of God. He's revealed himself to us as fully man who lived a life like we live. And he died to pay a full penalty for our sins. He was raised from the dead and he invites you now today and as long as it's called today listen today don't harden your heart in unbelief turn to christ in belief and accept the rest that he gives <laughs> paul harvey said and that is the rest of the story this is his story about rest and he wants to take the burdens and it's not going to remove them totally from your life. But that double yoke, take my yoke upon you. His head's already through. He's inviting you to stick your head through the yoke. You're going to find those burdens are a whole lot easier. That yoke is a whole lot lighter and he's going to take care of you. And at night, even though the whole world turns against you, your own family may be suffering, you, the, the people closest to you may be sick, may be dying. You yourself may be struggling with this. Jesus offers peace. He offers rest. And he gives those things. And I'm not saying you've never experienced it. I'm just inviting you with the invitation of Christ. Would you accept his invitation? Because his yoke really is easy. His burden really is light. It's living a life of love. It's living a life of love where you're seeking to, to bring pleasure and honor to another. When you do things out of obligation, it's a huge burden. When you do things out of love, it's a pleasure. Time flies. You're actually energized because you're doing it to please another. Jesus invites you to that kind of a life. That's what you were designed for. I'm inviting you with the invitation of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary, and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I will give you rest. I'm gentle and humble of heart. My friend, I really genuinely pray that you will accept the invitation of Jesus Christ today.